We marked out a circle and worked through the night to dig a collective grave. grave. I fear spades slicing into the earth and flinging free dirt into the air. Our mouths spitting red tracers of talk and tobacco onto the sky. We gathered what we could into boxes and baskets and buried it, then came with our weapons and stood around the steeple dirt, uttered their names. Some wept, others remained silent, some burst into hymns while others danced our calamities. If a man dances alone, he would not dance for long. I open my mouth and hot flames of wind shoot out of me. No words. I puff on the cigarette and trails of smoke float to the rising half moon. Words, like little grains of uncooked rice rattling in a tin can, now rumble inside me. Through the sticks, I tell myself, through the sticks. Let the words vibrate through the skins, I say, through the skins. Syllables escape. Words release themselves in hiccups, in beats, staccato, syncopated, long and short, quarter, half, sixteenth beats, with spaces in between for silence. With silence. It is in the beat. Silence. It is in the knock, knock, knock at the center of my chest. I roll my sticks across the skins of all the drums. I bang the drum. I bang the drum. My words fall out of me loud and clear in Tagalog, in Ilocano. And if you've forgotten the mother tongue, then hear the words in your precious English, Inai. I kick the bass drum. I kick the bass drum. I was a fine violin till I broke in half. Could not take the pressure and split. Now I sit, gluing myself with prayer and gentle song. Each day, a little here, a little here, calling on the master musician to touch where I can't reach. He places his hand in the small of my spine. My seams fuse together, perhaps more beautiful than before. When Lena ran out of the skeletal parts, the body was 80% complete. She didn't have the skills to make any assumptions about the specimen or who had inhabited it, but she guessed there would be a skull somewhere. She walked back into the corner where she had found the bones. Deep in the corner, a rock sat, sinking into the ground. Lena approached it, squatted, and pushed as hard as she could. The rock edged away. The soil below was cooler and finer than the rest of the garden. She dipped her hand in and immediately felt the solidness of the skull. Wrenched in every direction, pulling and jiggling, she freed it. A human head, somebody's face, a brain, eyes, senses, and sense. Holding it high, she went back to, to the back driveway and placed it at the top of her incomplete body, then aligned the other bones as neatly as she could. She turned toward the house and found her mother standing behind her, quiet, solid. Mom, look what I found, Lena pointed to her display. Some of the soldiers from the right off bed, or maybe some of the Syrians. No, Lena, her mother's voice was low and frightened, her body stiff. What's wrong, what? She grabbed her mother's arm. It was his fault, Lena. I was so angry. Upon landing, we rushed through the fluorescent corridors of the New Capitals Airport in a clutch of expats, women in faux furs corralling small herds of well-turned-out children, northern businessmen with embroidered caps and layers and layers of gleaming damas, bored hipsters with British accents, bodies tightly encased, in head-to-toe denim outfits, pressed and distressed within an inch of their lives. <laughs> Everyone working their cell phones as if Nigeria has not one sunny minute to spare. Of course, the BBC's fixer doesn't meet us in customs as promised, and our cell phones don't work. Together, Don Quixote and I stand guard as best we can over our 14 equipment bags and watch passenger after passenger negotiate his way past the phalanx of uniformed soldiers and out into the chaos beyond. 
Though the country is supposedly now returned to civilian rule, the wall of military green looks ominously familiar. Feel free to bust out Havana style, I'm tempted to tell them. <laughs> <laughs> that is, if I weren't feeling so proud myself. The flight to the interior accumulates two more crew members. First is a sound man, a young Kenyan in heavy timberlands and a Nike cap, who will attempt to romance first me and then my younger sister. <laughs> His fatal mistake being, in my case, the decision to romance us both within hours on the same day. <laughs> and in her case, an apparent disregard for deodorant. <laughs> Adana will wrinkle her nose in our third floor hotel room and declare, I think I can smell Moses downstairs in the lobby. <laughs> the second is the BBS, BBC fixer, an impeccably dressed Nigerian from a minor and therefore an Igbo land useless tribe, with a resplendent array of clothes all crammed into a tiny rollaway. His contribution to the production, other than managing more gratuitous costume changes than a Bollywood musical, <laughs> will consist of charging 4,000 naira to get us bottled water and peanuts, equivalently 31 US dollars, then disappearing for hours with the change. Mmm, <laughs> <laughs> my sister is fond of saying, pass me more of those 4,000 buck peanuts. I would play just to hear your voice. Even if it was saying, you just can't go through with it. That things got too serious too quick, that you're sorry that you just can't see me again, even if I'm coming through town, because it's too soon. This was years before you sent me the coffee cup. You even ended the message with a referral for an article in the New York Times on multiple sclerosis for my mom. <laughs> You sounded even sadder with that part. Like, you thought about it before the call, thought it would be a good idea just to drop it in there. <laughs> to show that you had heart as you crushed my it. <laughs> it was a bad idea. <laughs> you knew it as you said it. I never looked the article up. <laughs> MS is incurable. <laughs> what is the point of it all? <laughs> I didn't hear from you again until good news happened. To me, you called to say congratulations. You called to say, I know you so I can claim something. And I was so polite. <laughs> I was so cordial that you asked for a favor. <laughs> so I did you the favor. Dangerous trains of thought. And Marcy still can't get her Chinese colleague to agree to a forum for writers of color living in the 21st century on indigenous land. And I'm thinking of how they planted Poston and Gila River on reservations. And the head of WRA, Dylan Meyer, after the war, headed the BIA, proving the U.S. picked the right man for the job. And I'm tracking Sherman's Indian killer. And at the point where the protagonist decides he has to kill a white man, the words spark this jolt within me. And I think how this Indian was raised by whites and doesn't know who he is. As I did not know all those years rooting for the cowboys and Johnny Rev, John Wayne at Iwo Jima, Buana fending off Mau Mau's, drums in the distance saying, we eat well tonight, white meat for all. And I wonder if it's the pale poet reading at the lectern his insipid poems, or the fox diddlehead, or the latest teen flick hero with sensitive blue eyes, or is it the white man still breathing inside me? I must kill just to see who I might be. 
Uh, let me confess. I love Santo Domingo. I love coming home to the guys in blazers trying to push little cups of Brugada into my hand. I love the plane landing, everybody clapping when the wheels kiss the runway. I love the fact that I'm the only nigga on board without a Cuban link or a flapjack of makeup on my face. I love the redhead woman on her way to see the daughter that she hasn't seen in years. The gifts she holds in her lap like the bones of a saint. Mi hija has tetas now, the woman with her. The last time I saw her, she could not even speak. I love the bags my mother packs, shit for relatives, and something for my girl Magda, a gift. You give this to her, no matter what happens. If this was another kind of story, I would tell you about the sea. What it looks like after it's been forced into the sky through a blowhole. How when I'm driving in from the airport and see it like this, like shredded silver, I know I'm back for real. And I would tell you about how many poor motherfuckers there are. More albinos, more cross-eyed niggers, more tigres than you'll ever see. And I would tell you about the traffic, the entire history of late century 20th, of late 20th century automobiles swarming across every flat stretch of ground a cosmology of battered cars, battered motorcycles, battered trucks, and battered buses, and an equal number of repair shops run by any fool with a wrench. <laughs> and I would tell you about the no, I would tell you about our shanties and our no running water faucets and the sandbows on our billboards, and the fact that my family home comes equipped with the ever reliable latrine. And I would tell you about my abuelo and his campo hands how unhappy he is that I'm not sticking around. And I would tell you about the street where I was born, Calle 21, how it hasn't decided yet if it wants to be a slum or not, and how it has been in a state of indecision for years. Portate bien. Behave yourself, you always said to me. And I behaved myself when others were warm in winter and I stood out in the cold. And I behaved myself when others had full plates and I stared at them hungrily through the window. Never speaking out of turn, existed in a shell of good behavior with my heart, became a wet feathered bird growing but never cracking out of the shell. Behaving like a good boy until my behavior shattered by outsiders who came to the village one day insulting my grampito because he couldn't speak English. And it was that moment that English became the invader's sword, the oppressor's language, that hurled me into a profound despair. That day, Grandpa and I walked into the farm office for a loan. And this man didn't give Grandpa an application porque era stupid. He said, because you're ignorant and you're inferior. And that moment cut me in two pieces, one screaming that my grandito was a lovely man. And the other that this office government clerk was a beast. And I saw my Grandpa's eyes go dark with wound hurts of regret that his grandchild would see him humiliated. And I knew that day I knew that day that the African tree of his soul was burned and cut, using English as a language to cut it down. I knew it. None of us is static, which means we all fuck up. All of us fail, excel at one thing or the other, and sometimes not for long. Things are always breaking, shifting, moving out of range. Either you are in motion or you're dead. <laughs> it feels like just a moment ago I was in love with a boy. Two decades later, I am nearly falling for the life I have chosen with a woman and a daughter, traveling oceans, worlds apart. Years later, we are still hashing at details, still trying to make sense of these walls, falling, these hearts, always breaking every year we negotiate new variables. And that's the thing about hearts. They are always pounding, always bruising each other, other people, all the time. Those of us who are lucky get forgiven for the shit we do until others learn to forget what they have been doing to us. <laughs> Stories are always one-sided unless you talk to all narrators. <laughs> and even then, words are never enough. You have to take pictures and draw maps, caption them, tag them as proof poems. Are only a small part of recounting, even for the poet, pointing razors at her speckled pubes. Never mind the creams they try to sell us. Never mind the promise of vanishing years. Time will eventually catch us covering cesarean scars with loose clothing. 
Some days I wake up wanting to run naked through Times Square. <laughs> Tell the onlookers to stare if they wish. <laughs> and fucking look away. Whatever you like, whatever you see, is what is there. This is it, motherfuckers. <laughs> Counting all the horrors behind me, all the laughter still to come. Yes, I'm still coming, motherfuckers. I am still counting orgasms and hours and moments I recognize my most authentic self. I'm still evolving. Mother or daughter, sister or son, we all have to come to terms with who we are, who we have been to others, to ourselves. We are only unfinished poems.